Hello, Dominic Herbst here, the author of Restoring Relationships. And before I get in to the message this morning, I want to remind you all that we are starting our uh, in Zoom encounter focusing on depression, on anxiety, fear, and even panic. Actually, at 1 p.m. today, there's still time to sign up and register with us. We'd love to have you. And all you would have to do is call our office or go on walking through Calvary. Dot, uh, I believe it's dot com, walking through Calvary, and you can sign up right there, and we can get you the Zoom um, invite. And we'd love to have you. We uh, began our Prodigal Spouse series last night, and uh, we had a great kickoff. Uh, looking forward to the next three weeks there. Once again, uh, 1 p.m. to 2.30 today will be depression, anxiety, fear, panic, etc. So let's get into this message. Three reasons why you are still in bondage and three actions that will set you free. You know, the Lord does not want us to uh, wonder how we can be set free and why we continue in this struggle, in this tug of war with the enemy and the drawing of the Holy Spirit of God versus the pulling of the enemy to try to pull us in the direction of, of trusting him rather than trusting in the Lord God who had sent his son uh, to, uh, to redeem us, to uh, cleanse our sin and to also give us victory over sin, Satan, and death. So the first reason that we are still in bondage is we're trusting in ourselves. We cannot trust in fallen flesh. We cannot trust in the nature of humanity, a fallen humanity. Do you know that Jeremiah 17, 9 says that the heart, the human heart, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked? Who can know it? We can't trust in a wicked heart. That's what's in us. Now, praise God, those of you that are believers as I am in Christ Jesus, His Holy Spirit regenerates our human spirit. So we have the life of Christ living within us. So we have an opportunity to trust Him rather than in trusting in ourselves. And as you know, and you've heard me quote many times in Jeremiah 17, 5, and I'm going to give you a few other verses than what I normally do. It says, Cursed is the man who trusts in man, that means trusting in yourself as well, and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert. Now, you've seen desert images. You've probably been in the desert, as I have. And when you think of a shrub out in the dry place of the desert, and you think, wow, what a wasteland. And he goes on, the writer, or the uh, Holy Spirit, in the writing of this uh, script says, and shall not see when good comes. That means when you're trusting in yourself, you actually will not see what God is doing in the spirit realm. You've blinded yourself. You don't want to be trusting in yourself. You want to be trusting in Christ fully, completely, and will not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness. Well, who wants parched places where there's no purifying, cleansing water, life-giving water, parched places, desert places where things don't grow? in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. Interesting that the salt land was given as an example here of a person who's under curse. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of the uh, Bonneville's at Salt Flats or, uh, and, of course, the, long, the, the Salt Lake in Utah. You know, they say nothing. there's no life in it. There's no life in long, rolling salt lands, and there's no li there's no life in in that salt lake. Thing things can't thrive in it. And these are analogies that tell us when we're trusting in ourselves, this is all we get. You don't want to be trusting in yourself when you're in a major battle, the biggest battle of your life and life eternal is to have victory and, and uh, cleansing over and away from the enemy at all costs. So the first thing is trusting in yourself. That is why we're still in bondage. The second, we're bound in bitterness. The bitter root creates bitter fruit. Look diligently, look carefully, lest any root of bitterness spring forth and many be defiled. Those that live under a bitter person are splashed with sewage. Yeah, things that come out of the bitter heart create bitter fruit and create a bitter splash, and people don't want to be around that. When I had that bitterness, I didn't even want to be around me. 
well, wherever I want went, there there I was. And what was in me was right there with me. So it didn't matter. You can't escape it because it's in us, that bitterness, and it has to be cleansed out. So we are held and bound. We're held captive by a bitter root. And that's what allows the enemy to build the stronghold around us because he now comes in, fortifies his presence to torment us in the bitterness. We actually invite enemy spirit activity to torment us. Interesting. Our, our human spirit is regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit when we receive Christ. But in our soul, if we're nurturing bitterness, we are actually inviting enemy attack to give enemy spirits too much influence over and through our lives. And we wonder why. We wonder because we trust in ourselves and because we're bound in bitterness. And thirdly, that because of pride, we are blind with hatred. See, once we hate a person who has offended us, hurt us, or even God himself, because we feel he's the one responsible for all the th struggles that we're going through, the enemy will bombard us with all these lies that tell us God's responsible for why you're going through this. I mean, after all, he's God. He could rescue you. He could preempt all this, but it still happens. But please understand that God gave free will even to our enemies. And God will have great and holy purpose for us in the struggle of walking through that pain, that season of pain. And God has purpose in all pain. All pain has purpose. And therefore, if we are now blind with hatred, it's because we're filled with pride, believing that now trusting in ourselves, which is prideful, now nurturing that bondage of bitterness, which is also part of the blinding pride, because we're not going to see the root. That's why they're called roots. And we don't see the hatred in us. And that's First John 2, 9 to 11. Um, if any man hates his brother, he walks in darkness and he stumbles. Therefore, and that's written to the believer. The Apostle John, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, is, is actually speaking to believers who know Christ. And he said, brethren, you're hating one another. This should not be. But now that hate has blinded you and you're blind in pride. And you're actually, when you hate your brother, you're sinning against God. It's hate for God. And when you're blind with hatred, you're unable to see the enemy's influence in your life, and it represents deliberate rebellion against God, producing the spirit of murder. Yeah, our hearts can become murderous, even if we do not use our hands to carry it out. God judges the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It doesn't get any worse than 1 John uh, 3.15, that if a man or a woman, any human being, hates another human being, he or she is a murderer, is a murderer. That's a metaphor. That's not a simile. We are murdering from our heart. That is direct and deliberate rebellion against God. Of course we're going to be in bondage. But we've created our own web uh, of captivity. We've created the bars and the walls, and the enemy is in there tormenting us on the basis of that. Another really good read is um, uh, Matthew 18 um, and it goes from, I think, 20-something into 32 to 35. It's the parable of the wicked servant who was forgiven all of his debt. His debt represented sin. The king forgave him who represents Christ. He represents a sinner that could never have paid the debt, but he's forgiven. Then he goes out and he jacks a guy up against the wall and said, you pay me all that you owe me, which was about 15 cents worth measured against lifetimes of debt. And then... He, because of his hatred for the one who had hurt him, offended him, or withheld from him, that hatred puts him in direct rebellion against the very king or the Christ who forgave him. So he now goes into a place where he's in torment, even though he trusted the king in forgiving his debt, as we trust Christ to forgive our sin, but now he goes into the torment of the unbeliever. And he's thrown and he's shackled in there. And it says that unless you and I forgive from our heart, so shall our torment be. And we will be subject to the tormentors. We don't have to do that. We don't have to come under that. This ends when we say it does. Well, you know why? Jesus said, I finished it at Calvary. It is finished. That's what he meant. His death, his resurrection conquered sin, Satan, and death. Sin has no more power. Death has no sting. It cannot hold us captive. And, and the power of the enemy is totally broken. So why are we coming under it? Here's why. We're in self-will and the pride 
of doing things our way, my way, and that's the trusting in ourselves. We're in deep bitterness for violations against us, and we're in deep hatred, which is a sin of murder, and which is direct rebellion against God. You and I cannot be set free with even one of those entanglements. But many of us, of us, as I was, are entangled by all three. All three, that's a web, that's a power that no fallen human being can break. Only the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, which begs the question, okay, what are the three actions that will set me free? All right, let's take a look at that. So right now, stop trying to heal yourself and have a prosperous life if these three forces that we just shared are the forces that operate within you. Eventually, they will define you. They will destroy you and your relationships and everything precious. Your hope for a, a good uh, uh, career, a ministry, all of that will be jaded and contaminated by those three areas of bitterness, of self-will, trusting in yourself, and of hatred will poison and contaminate everything you and I touch. And to nurture bitterness and hatred in the heart is to allow cancer to grow in your soul. You would never nurture cancer cells. They devour the body. That's why Satan is called the devourer. So when you and I have bitterness and hate, we're allowing enemy spirit activity to devour us from the inside. They're parasitic. They suck life out of us. They suck blessing and, and re remove us from blessing. So you, and Jesus said this to the Pharisees because they struggled with all three of these areas, so filled with the blindness of pride and hatred and bitterness and trusting in themselves through religious structure. And he said to them, you are of your father the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning and a liar. And he is the father of lies. Imagine being told your dad is the devil. That's what Jesus told them. Think about it. And he also said later on that, that the truth isn't in him. There's no truth in the devil. So what kind of truth would be in someone who's influenced by the enemy? They're, they're not going to really know truth. At the, at the best, they're going to be double-minded. So to have Christ and his spirit reigning in your human spirit, cleansing you day after day, renewing mercies and grace every day, and then nurturing cancer of hate and bitterness in your soul, well, and wonder why we're not set free. And that's why only Christ can do it. And we have to be careful because a lot of counseling out there will have you do certain things that uh, they say are according to truth, but if they lack attacking these enemy uh, uh, actions that we have done or these places where uh, we are, are still kept in bondage, then we're not going to be set free. We have to stop trusting in ourselves. We have to be cleansed of bitterness, and we have to be set free from hatred. And therefore, we have to humble ourselves, and the pride goes with it all. That pride cannot be there. It's the most blinding force in the universe. It caused the fall of Satan. Look at Isaiah 14, if you don't believe me. The creature actually believed he could usurp the throne of the Creator. He said, I will, five times. I will do this. I will rise above the stars of God on the sides of the north. I will rise above, I think, something like the throne. I don't have the exact quotations. Satan actually believed in blinding pride that he could, he could take over the Creator's position of heaven. Think about how devastating, how, how dark a person must be under that kind of pride. Knowing Knowing what Christ did for you and I, why would you and I stay under that? Why would we polish that shield that we put out there for our loved ones to see how prideful we are? The very thing that we protect most about us is our pride, is the very thing people hate the worst about us, hate the most about us, pride. Only the devil could cause you and I to come under the lie that we're going to hold and maintain the pride because somehow it's our protective shield. Oh, my word. Look how blind we have become in the pride. Surrender it. There's nothing good in it. Repent for it. And that's what takes us to the three actions that will set us free. First of all, repentance that comes only from godly sorrow. Godly sorrow that leads to repentance, 
not worldly sorrow. You say, well, I've been weeping, but I'm not, I'm not there yet. That's because it's worldly sorrow. And by the way, in the Zoom that we have today, when we talk about depression, the affliction of depression, fear, anxiety, and panic, do you know what that is? That's the expression of worldly sorrow. That's what worldly sorrow causes. Because it's, it's, there might be um, uh, water there, but it's not a cleansing water. It's a contaminated water. It's a toxic water. You know, you've seen these little puddles and ponds out in the middle of fields. They have no springs of life coming in them. There's no life or movement. And in the stagnation, mosquitoes breed there. Oh, they get oily. They get contaminated. And that toxicity is in the soul of world, through worldly sorrow in the person who's got that bitterness and hate and who's trusting in themselves. Therefore, in the soul, they're contaminated and it grows bitter roots and it grows cancer of the soul, which is the bitterness and the hatred. And that's why that has to be cleansed out. The soul has to be purified. And it only comes with a spirit of repentance and with the flow of godly sorrow through the Holy Spirit from the throne room. The streams of godly sorrow, they cleanse, they purify. They bring life. They bring new life and new breath into the soul. They, they, they cleanse of all parasitic invasion of the enemy. They cleanse from all the pride and the bondage of self-will. Cleanse it from all sin of, of trusting in ourselves. So I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. That's Luke 13, 3. This, the one message of unity, uh, and they were unified in all messages, but the one that was repeated was uh, John the Baptist and Jesus, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Now, many of us as believers are hearing that and saying, well, I did. I repented of my sin and I received Christ. Praise God. However, the enemy is accessing your place of greatest need right now. Now that the sin has been cleansed, your place of greatest need is the place of un- uh, uh, healed pain in your soul. See, he takes the unhealed pain and he gets in there and he stirs that up with a spirit of bitterness and hatred for who inflicted that pain. And then the enemy gets in there and he then puts you under the bondage of those three areas that we covered at the beginning of this presentation. That's why we must have the Holy Spirit come in to the place where only the enemy had access. He must shine the light to, to pierce the blindness where I didn't see the bitterness, where I didn't know I had the hatred. And by so doing, the, we repent and we come to the end of ourselves and we say, oh God, I don't want to be this way. I don't want to be under this bondage. I don't want to live in this contamination anymore. So the next thing after repent is surrender, fully surrender, total surrender to God through Christ. And here's a good definition. To surrender in spirituality means that a believer completely gives up his own will and subjects his thoughts, his ideas, and his deeds to the will and the teachings of the Lord God. And it's like submission, full submission before God is surrender. It's willful acceptance and yielding to the dominating force. The only one who deserves to have our full surrender and submission, our Creator God, who loved us so much, He sent His only begotten Son. So in repentance, through godly sorrow, leads to a full surrender. And thirdly, in order to be set free, trust and obey. These two are inextricably tied together. So they're all number three of that which will set you free. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all you, thy ways, in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. One of the hardest things for believers is to trust in God to the point that they let him order their steps and direct their paths, which he promises to do. So many people come to me because of the confusion and doubts that the enemy has put in their mind and say, well, what, what does that look like to, to trust and obey? Think about what that, what you're saying in that question. Now, come on. It's trusting and surrendering fully, completely, and letting the Lord walk with you in your steps, not getting ahead of Him, inquiring of Him. And Jesus said, if you seek me, you will find me. If you seek me with all of your heart, it is 
and the steps and the acts of obeying his truth. And by the way, his truth is revealed in his word. And right there is his word. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Shall in the realm of law is absolute. It's without any other consideration. He shall fully direct your paths. All right. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he will do it. That was Psalms 37, 5. The previous verse is Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Why don't you commit that to memory? My father-in-law, that was his life verse. And it, it seeped into me. And I want to tell you that it's rarely a day goes by that I don't think about those verses. But thinking about them is not enough. Obey them. Walk in it. It's not enough to be awakened to the understanding of truth. You must walk in it to be transformed. That's obedience to it. Trust and obedience is the transformation. These are action verbs, folks. These are action verbs to trust and to obey. You don't default into truth. You take action to say, I trust you today, Lord, for every detail of my life, my thought, my action. And as I walk it out, I walk with you and you walk with me. The enemy's going to do everything to get you distracted and get your focus off of God. And he's going to try to get in there and be your foster father. Yeah, the enemy. Don't be of your father, the devil, while you belong to the Lord Christ, who is your Abba Father, Romans 8.15. Put yourself back up for adoption into the, the hands of your Abba Father, your Father God and your Christ Jesus. He's your Abba. He's your Daddy. And go to him. Get away. Break free from your father, the devil. Stop trusting in him as if you know not the Lord. Obedience to God. So uh, one of the most striking examples of the pr principle of obedience is when Saul was told to go and attack uh, uh, the, the uh, place of the Amalekites, of Amalek. And he was told to destroy everything, including the animals. Yeah, so that all contamination of the heathen uh, people would not contaminate Israel. Well, Saul had a better idea, and he, he held back many of the uh, spoils of that war, and they were to be destroyed, and he held back the animals. And you might think, well, isn't that a little bit, well, so what? Well, if we're thinking like, you know, a man who's trusting in himself, we're going to say, yeah, so what? A few animals, right? And that's what Saul was saying. And, and Samuel, the prophet, who represents God to man, said, uh, what is this bleeding I hear, bleating of these sheep? Where did they come from? So he called Samuel out, or I'm sorry, he called, Samuel called Saul out for keeping some of the things that God had told him to destroy. And Saul, and he, Saul had beguiling spirit in him. A beguiler is a person who tries to use a piece of truth, but then he ensnares you with the lie. Well, Samuel wasn't having it. He said, well, I saved the animals so that I could sacrifice them to God. Samuel's immediate response, thus saith the Lord, to obey is better than sacrifice. To obey is better than sacrifice. Right there it is. Without obedience, without trust and obedience, without fully surrendering, and without repenting, you and I cannot be set free. We will not be set free. Stop looking for freedom outside of the perfect word of God. Stop looking for ways to get around the truth when all you're called to do is walk in it. And I don't care who your friends are, who your counselors are, including me. If I speak anything else but truth, go listen to somebody else. Because I have nothing to offer you if it's not truth. My opinions have no value. And people have all these opinions how we're going to get set free. As if you could somehow reason your way to freedom. You and I will never reason our way to freedom. The mere passage of time will never change our hearts. You know, two or three years or 20 years, I'm sure I'll be a different person. You could live three lifetimes and be in full bondage as you are right now. It takes the purposeful, intentional actions of obedience to God. 
and the enemy is postured to battle you every step of the way. He will do everything to hold you in captivity until you repent, until you trust and obey, and until you fully surrender to God. There's your, there's your remedy. Three actions that will set you free. There it is. And it's impossible that you won't be set free if you feed into this truth and walk in it every day and watch how the Lord shows himself strong on the behalf of you whose heart is right before him. So pray with me and look for your full and complete freedom. Father God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we come against all enemy that lies all enemy deceptions, all pride that we have embraced from the enemy. We renounce this day that we will no longer trust in ourselves, which places us under curse. We will renounce this day that any bitterness that is in us, we not only renounce, we repent of it. And we ask that you cleanse us. And any hatred that is in us, we repent for the hatred, the murdering spirit that is in us. And we ask, Lord, that you would give us mercy Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Purify our hearts with godly sorrow. Cleanse, purify. Give me the spirit of godly sorrow. I rebuke and bind every enemy. And I gag every voice of the enemy that is attempting to come against this truth. And I cast them away from all that are receiving this truth. In order that each one of us can come boldly to the throne of grace and repent of our sin of pride and hatred and bitterness and self-will. And Lord, we obey, we trust this day, and we repent. And Lord, we surrender. In the name of Jesus, bring full and complete cleansing for how we've rebelled against you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We'll see you next week, and don't forget, there's still time to join us this afternoon, 1 o'clock Eastern Time, to join us in the depression, in the uh, panic, uh, uh, in the uh, anxiety. If you're struggling with any of that, even worry, come and join us, and we'll walk in the steps of freedom. This is not just counsel. This is discipleship, that you might walk in the truth with the Holy Spirit. See you soon.